Um, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the National Sporting Library and Museum. Every time we have an event lately, it's completely sold out within 24 hours. So I just want to say, uh, send an enormous thank you to all of our members who are incredibly generous and make programs like this possible. So thank you, so, thank you so very much. And tonight, um, if you have not seen, we have an amazing exhibit next door at our museum, Survival of the Fittest. How many of you all have seen Survival of the Fittest? Oh, wow, that makes me so excited. <laughs> um, well, many people are coming twice. Um, please tell your friends about it. It's just an incredibly um, special exhibition, and it really does complement a lot of what we're doing now in terms of conservation and even looking at Theodore Roosevelt and his history, it's the same time frame, um, also just the in, incredible influence that he had on conservation and open space and our national parks and um, what a great sportsman. But uh, again, I just want to thank our dynamic team here at the National Sporting Library Museum. If you all could just stand for a minute, because you've done so much. <laughs> very special exhibit uh, opening, um, and Colleen Yarger, I'm not sure where you are, Colleen, who is our Georgia Orstrom uh, Curator of Library Collections, and she has just brought this library to life. So in the, um, in the Forest D. Mars Senior um, Gallery downstairs, our exhibit hall, you will be seeing much more phenomenal exhibits thanks to Colleen and partnering with uh, uh, many of our uh, other organizations and friends who have learned to that particular exhibit. Um, when we look at this, did, it, did any of you have a chance, I know some of you went downstairs and many said you were gonna go a different day, just did anyone get to go downstairs and see the exhibit yet? Um, I know it's hard when there's cocktails and great hors d'oeuvres. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I definitely wanna say thank you to Jackie Mars for underwriting this wonderful event. <laughs> Um, the exhibit will be open um, after the talk, so um, you know, please feel free to go down and see this. Um, you'll be able to see some holdings um, from our F. Ambrose Clark Rare Book Room, again highlighting a lot of the traditional field sports that Theodore Roosevelt was involved with, also the conservation causes um, that he was involved with. Um, his life actually is going to overlap about a bunch of the subject matter, which I mentioned, that is in our museum next door. Um, I really, before we move on, would like just to recognize, I mentioned, and I wanted you know, everyone to thank Jackie Mars again for hosting this wonderful evening. We also want to thank Bundles, Murdoch. Um, yes. you, Bundles. <laughs> so, Bundles inspired this uh, <laughs> event, and um, some of the early discussions, one thing led to the other, and she helped us organize this, she helped us put things together. Um, was very instrumental um, in inviting Tweed, our speaker, who we'll hear more from a little bit later, and also um, just very, very appreciative that Lucky Roosevelt is joining us also um, this evening over here. Thank you so very, very much. I just really want to express my gratitude to the Roosevelts for making this trip and joining us at the National Sporting Library Museum. So, so thank you so very much. Um, I, I will have to read the following because Lucky is involved in so many different things, and I just wanted to point out um, she's an American journalist, patron of the arts, chairman emeritus of the Blair House Foundation, former chief of protocol of the United States under Ronald Reagan. Um, so an impressive background, and we're just thrilled you could visit. Um, we also, we're all very excited to have joining us, is Tweet uh, Roosevelt here this evening. Um, he is also has an incredible background, He's chairman of the Theodore Roosevelt Institute. He's also president of the Society of Presidential Descendants. Um, and he also, you know, I guess really most fortunately for us, um, he is the Roosevelt family historian. So he is the official historian. So I think he's gonna be able to regale us with many stories this evening um, that we may not always find in all the books. Plus there is an incredible um, relationship with Roosevelt and horses. So that is also quite wonderful um, for us here uh, in the Middleburg area. So you're gonna be shining a spotlight on many stories. We were thrilled. Um, please join me in welcoming Roosevelt. <laughs> It 
should be vodka, but it isn't. <laughs> well, we can, uh, we can make that happen. No. <laughs> I, I can take it This movie's around, so if I suddenly, you know, push me back. Can you hear me from the back? Yes, yes sir. All right, good. Uh, that's sort of a silly question, because if you couldn't hear me, you wouldn't say anything. <laughs> anyway, I went over and looked at that exhibit. It is fabulous. I had no idea of anything about this until I got contacted. Uh, what a great operation you have here. Really, extraordinary. Thank you. <laughs> and, and those, those four artists, just something else. I've got a whole pile of folders that I'm going to give around to various people who are no longer. Uh, I'm going to start out with an ad. Uh, it was mentioned. It was mentioned that I'm the president. Actually, created something called the Society of Presidential Descendants. There was no such organization. About four years ago, I created it. So we have a number of sort of objectives. One, obviously, is to get the presidential descendants together. But we are also interested in presidential studies and civics. So we have some civics operation. But in presidential studies, our, our flag course at the moment. Are flag, whatever it's called, is uh, a biannual presidential leadership book award. And uh, Brush Loss is coming this year as our master of ceremonies. We're doing it on Saturday in Washington. If you'd like to come, you can learn about those books and see which one wins. It's a big secret, only I. And the three judges know who won. <laughs> uh, we give a substantial prize of $10,000 to the winner, so it's a, it's a big deal. And it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be at the University Club in D.C. So if any of you want to contact me, you can do it through here. Absolutely. And we have about six seats left, maybe, for the uh, maximum. So anybody interested, enough of the ad. Uh, so let me see if this works. There we go. Uh, you may recognize that. <laughs> so tonight I'm going to talk... I, I give talks on TR and conservation and all you know, TR history. I've given a whole uh, semester course on TR and its politics at the time. So I only have a few minutes here, and I figured I'd focus, and I thought you might be interested in horses. And I didn't really know very much about TR and horses, so it was an opportunity for me to learn about it. Uh, I discovered, it shouldn't have been a surprise, but I discovered that, uh, I'm going to have some nice slides here. I discovered that T.R.'s life, really, horses were central to his life the entire time. And I had no idea of sort of his relationship with horses. Of course, there are many statues. This one is in Minot, North Dakota. Uh, there was one in front of the American Museum of Natural History. We won't go into that today. Those <laughs> <laughs> no, that's sad history. But um, uh, they're, they're a whole bunch of them around. So there's one in Portland, Oregon. There's one in his hometown, Oyster Bay, and so on. So uh, horses really were central. And I tried to figure out his first relationship with horses. Uh, and all I could come up with is when he was a little boy, some of you may know that when he was a little boy, he was very unhealthy. He suffered from asthma, which almost killed him. Asthma in those days could often be fatal and was terribly upsetting, not only to the parents and the sufferer, because he just breasted for air, but even for the doctors, who were, you know, they couldn't do much about it. Anyway, they had all these crazy ideas. And they gave him <coughs> big cups of coffee, which I think created his love of coffee. <laughs> and one, he, he had a signature coffee cup, which was about the size of a bathtub, <laughs> and very when people would produce this. And he was the guy that came up with the phrase, good to the last drop, <laughs> uh, So, uh, but that's a sign. Another thing, I, we're talking about a five-year-old, maybe? They'd make him smoke cigars. <laughs> which I don't know why they thought that was a good idea. But, you know, actually, I ran into a friend of mine who's an asthma specialist at Harvard Medical School, and who said that, it, incidentally, it's not a bad idea. It does something, whatever it does. So it seemed kind of surprising. But the horse's part of this was his father, when he was having these attacks, and they're periodic, they don't happen all the time, and they come unexpectedly, which is one of the things that makes them terrifying. His father, if it was in the middle of the night, would take him, they lived in New York, would take him in their carriage, open carriage, Landau, I think, 
and race through New York trying to force air down here. Uh, and so that's kind of my first uh, sort of indication that I saw where he had said something about horses. He wrote about it later in life. His last horse encounter, I don't know either. He was quite sick in the hospital. He came home to uh, Long Island to Oyster Bay to Sagamore Hill, where he it was a couple of weeks before he died. He undoubtedly visited his horses there. So that's the best I can say about that. Uh, so there's a central, central role here. And he, horses played a central role in both the worst day of his life and the best day of his life. Uh, and I thought I'd start with the worst day of his life. I mean, I should go through here, pay attention. The worst day of his life was the day uh, he was 24, I think, I don't remember. Uh, his wife, brand new wife, had just given birth to a little baby in New York. He'd been in Albany. Uh, he was in the, in the legislature at the time. And his mother was uh, officiating at the birth. It was, at home, of course, at home. And uh, he got a message that he was the father of a girl. And then a little later, he got a message that things didn't look so good. He ought to get home. He got on a train. It was a harrowing by terrible weather that night. It took him a very long time to get home. When he got home on Valentine's Day, just after midnight, uh, his brother met him on the stoop of the, at the front steps of the house he was in, lived in, and said, your wife is dying and so is our mother. And they both died that day. Uh, and he was very close to his mother. And of course his wife was the only wife, little baby. So that's what he put in his journal. It's the only thing, it's a famous journal. It says, the light of my life, uh, what does it say? The light, the light has gone out of my life. Uh, very poignant. And uh, this was devastating to him, uh, as you might imagine. It was a double funeral at the big Episcopal church in, uh, in Manhattan. He sort of tried to finish his work, and then he went out west, uh, where he had created a ranch in, in North Dakota, in the Badlands. And his, his solution to this was ride, ride, ride on horses. And he wrote, once he rode 72 hours uh, at a stretch. And he, he, this was what he did. He just rode and rode. And his quote from then, I really love, let's see, get it right. Uh, black care, black care rarely sits, black care rarely sits behind a rider whose pace is fast enough. Uh, and one of the fascinating things about that period, you see him write about the Dakota Badlands from this period, and it's all very dark and grim, very badlands. He calls, he said, I think something like, the badlands look like, looks like Poe sounds. <laughs> uh, and, and it was brilliant words. Uh, and, uh, and things like that. And then you read later, when he sees the beauty of it, when he gets over it. So the, this horse therapy, if you want to call it that, really pulled him through. And uh, it took several months, but slowly he started getting better and better. Uh, and apparently, so much so that uh, by 1885, this was in 1884 when his wife died. In 1885, he went back to New York, uh, and his sister reintroduced him to a woman who he had a, uh, you know, a relationship as a teenager that kind of broke up, didn't go anywhere, and she had waited for him. And she came, he, he said to his sister, whatever you do when I come back, because I don't, he, his idea was that you only marry once. Uh, well, he was 24, and that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> the only man, and he's, he's thinking on this, he says, what happens if you have two wives and then you go up to heaven? And there they are. <laughs> so, I guess they didn't have the idea of alternative universes. <laughs> but anyway, he, uh, so he said, I don't know, I don't want to do it. And he knew her name was Edith, let me show you what she looked like in later life. Uh, pretty, very pretty. Edith, that was his second wife, by whom he had five more children. And uh, he was with her all the rest of his life. And uh, she was a fabulous wife for him. Uh, but anyway, his sister ignored his 
demand that, don't let me see Edith when I come back, and of course, what his sisters do. Uh, so he comes home, and strangely enough, the house was empty when he arrived, and somehow Edith was coming down the stairs, <laughs> and it was all over. So quickly they got engaged. He'd forgotten about his uh, swearing that he would never get married again. But they kept it secret for a while, and they were married a year later. So it turned out okay in the end. Now, the best day of his life, San Juan Hill. Uh, it was July 1st, 1889, in the famous charge up San Juan Hill or San Juan Heights. Uh, this, I, oh, I'm going to tell you the whole story. You probably know most of the story. But the thing that's fascinating about this has to do with the horses. So the Rough Riders was a cavalry group. But when they got to Tampa, which was the jumping off place where they would go to Cuba, there weren't enough ships to take both the horses and the soldiers. And so all the horses were left behind, except for two, I think, or three of TRs. Uh, and so they then got off the coast of Cuba, and the men were going to shore in little you know, lifeboats or whatever they were. The horses, they threw the horses over the side, and they were supposed to swim to the shore. There were only, I think, two or three of these main horses called Texas. And the horses started for the open ocean. And you know, they didn't quite know what to do here. Uh, but fortunately, a bugler uh, was on the ship. And so he did his bugle signal to the horses. And the horses turned around and came to shore. So those were the only horses in his group. So when the battle came, uh, which involved what anybody who's been in the military and faced this kind of situation knows, if you're attacking an entrenched enemy, it was up a steep, open grass, not high grass, open, started at a sort of a jungle, but once you started up the hill, it was clearly open, and they were all, the Spaniards were all entrenched at the top, shooting down at you. But this was an extremely dangerous situation, and it was a charge, an all-out charge, what TR always wanted, I guess. Uh, he, he, TR, did what I think every soldier in this situation wants. He didn't say, charge. He said, follow me. Mm. Uh, and up he went. You could see him. He's the only one on a horse. Yeah. Many observers, both US military and many foreign military observers, were observing the charge. Not a single person there thought that TR would make it to the hill, up the hill alive. Even the densest of Spanish soldiers, no, you shoot the man on the horse. Uh, and, uh, it, two people were killed right next to it. Uh, he was he was nicked with one bullet, but that was it. Uh, he made it to the top. It was actually three charges, but I don't have time to go into the whole thing here. Uh, and he survived. It's probably important to note that, that the casualties that the Rough Riders took that day were the highest casualties of anybody in the battle, and were something on the order of 35 to 40 percent, which is a spectacular number. So he was pretty lucky. Uh, and I guess the horse probably deserves some credit for that, I suppose. Uh, one of the more famous of the Rough Riders was a guy named Bucky O'Neill. He was older than all the rest of them. He was older than TR. He'd been a sheriff. He came from Prescott, Arizona. He'd been a sheriff. He was Fearless sheriff, and I think mayor, and this and that. He had all kinds of jobs. He's very, very well known at the time. But he, I think I shouldn't laugh, but he, he believed also in standing in front of his men. And they were at the bottom before the charge. He was standing there, and his men were standing up full in sight, men were all cowering down. And some one of his soldiers said, Sir, sir, you know, duck down. He said, The Spanish bullet isn't made yet. It could kill me. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, two minutes later, so, uh, he was killed. And, and here he is on a U.S. postage stamp. Uh, that's a statue in Prescott, Arizona. Uh, T.R. fortunately had the good sense not to make that kind of boast. Um, so anyway, uh, well, let's get into some of T.R. and horses. And I'm going to start with the recreation period. Uh, out west, and then we'll find a thing here. Here is TR out west. This is during the period that I told you about earlier. It's kind of an odd, look at it. 
Uh, you can imagine what the cowboys thought of him. First of all, he wore glasses, and the cowboys didn't want, they thought there was something morally wrong about wearing glasses. And they used to call him before, I give whole lectures on this subject too. Uh, but he spent a lot of time mostly on horseback. Uh, he took some rather extraordinary journeys, hunting trips, and one of them was, let me see if I get this right, was to the Bighorn Mountains in Wyoming. It took him, he and a, one of his ranch hands, and a, they had a little chuck wagon that was you know, sort of manned by this German named Lobo, who TR didn't think much of, he made some disparaging remarks about his brain power. But anyway, um, so they, it took, I forget now, I think it was two and a half weeks or three weeks to get to Sheridan, Wyoming from North Dakota. And then they went up in the Bighorns, and there he hunted grizzly and elk uh, and other things. So he came back with uh, a bunch of elk and two grizzlies, big grizzly. One of them was over a thousand pounds. <laughs> Imagine that. Uh, so he, he wrote about everything. TR's ventures in the West cost him half to two thirds of his fortune. So he had to make money. And he, the way he made money the rest of his life was by writing. He wrote, you have no idea, I mean, he wrote incredibly. He wrote almost, what is it that we think? It's somewhere around 34 books. Uh, and some of them are compilations. But, and he wrote at tremendous speed. He could turn out a book in six weeks, six or eight weeks. And they were very popular, particularly his hunting books. Uh, but he also wrote uh, 130, we know, 130,000 letters about that. And I uh, hundreds of perhaps even a thousand articles and hundreds of book book uh, introductions. When you see the exhibit, you'll see some of them. That's one of the highlights of the exhibit here. Is his uh, so you, there's even a handwritten copy of one of his. Uh, so his output was extraordinary. Anyway, uh, another trip he took, which is quite interesting, was to hunt what he called white goats, mountain goats. Uh, this painting, I don't remember who the artist is offhand. It's in Idaho, and he rode to Idaho. Uh, fabulous story about that. But you will see in the exhibit over at you know, the Four Artists exhibit, paintings that look very much like this of White Coast. There are two of them, I think. And uh, very much, it could be the same artist. Uh, anyway, it was a fabulous trip. I uh, retraced that. We retraced both the Big Horn trip, which I did in the automobile, <laughs> and the mountain goats. The thing about mountain goats is they're above the Big Horn sheep. They're way, way up there, and you really have to have stamina to get up and see them. So that was a heck of a trip. There's some great stories, but I don't have time to tell them either. Um, the, uh, 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 but he was successful, and it was interesting at the time. Very little was known about, let's not make myself seasick, but <laughs> very little was known about white coats. And in fact, many biologists didn't believe they existed. So he proved that. And uh, so it was, it was rather interesting. Uh, now we come to fox hunting. Uh, this photo is absolutely fabulous. And look at it carefully. Everything is in focus. It was taken in, uh, I think, maybe 03 or so, 1903. It was taken by a famous photographer named Jacob Rees, who TR had known for a long time and did some fabulous photography in New York with those big you know, frame, I'm not a camera guy, but big frame cameras. My son-in-law is a professional photographer. I showed him this, and he was actually absolutely blown away with it. You can see the depth of the, in, you know, it's in focus. And look, all four of the hooves are off the ground. Uh, and that's a high fence. I don't know how high, but it's a high fence. Um, that's at the Chevy Chase Country Club. Uh, <laughs> no way? It is. Oh. And, uh, so let me see what else have photos I got here. No, right? You prove me wrong. <laughs> uh, he lived on Long Island, and at the time, Long Island, the middle of Long Island, and Long Island was pretty rural then, 
and in the, he was on the north, and in the south was Meadowbrook, where the Meadowbrook hunt was. And so his brother was a big Meadowbrook Meadow hunt person, and so was he. And sometimes they started at Sagamore Hill, and that's what this photo is of. And they would ride across and so on. And then, uh, let's see, there's the country, there's the uh, Meadow, Meadowbrook Country Club. I don't know why I'm purple so bad. Uh, sort of main building. Uh, and there is a very interesting picture. This is Chevy Chase now. And that's, uh, you can see if you look carefully there, well, on the right, on my right, is it your right? I'm not sure. Yeah, you're right. Uh, is sort of one of the buildings. And you see three little figures there? Yeah. Well, here's what it is. Oops, there it is. And that's TR and Edith, the one of the second wife, and either my grandfather or my great uncle Quentin, it's not quite sure which, out for a Sunday walk, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, if you didn't believe that other picture, here's another <laughs> <Sorry>. one. <laughs> Look at that. Got a pretty good seat, too, I guess you'd say. I'm not anyway, anyway. So now we come to Poland, and this was quite a mystery. I had spent a certain amount of time trying to find out anything about TR and Polo. And I couldn't find at first anything. There were certainly no photographs, at least, that I could find. And uh, I didn't do a huge major search, but a good one. Uh, and then I saw, I came across a doctor's report of TR's health problems. And in it were two incidents where he had broken something, a rib, I think, in separate Polo games. So I knew at least that, you know, there was something. And then I was out in North Dakota last week, believe it or not, and I was talking to the Dickinson Center, which is where all, a lot of papers are, and they hauled out a letter he wrote mentioning that he'd been playing polo that day. So, but the only photograph I've got is this one, where TR, not a very good photo, I have no idea what that black lump is, maybe someone can figure it out. He's, he's just observing an international polo match, and that was the best, best I could do with that. So let's, other horse things going on here, uh, were his expeditions. He went to Africa for 10 months, and much of that was spent on horseback hunting animals, and that's a whole story. I'll give you a whole lecture on that sometime if you want. Uh, it's a fascinating story, uh, but horses clearly played a role in that. And the other major international expedition he want, went on was to Brazil uh, in 1914. I got the date right, I think so. Uh, where he went down the Amazon, and that's an extraordinary picture. So he was on horses there for quite a bit of it, but I thought I'd give you a respite from the horse pictures. <laughs> so there he is, sitting, as you can see, in gauntlets, mosquito nets, and all that. What he's doing there is he's writing his book. And he, the book was called Through the Brazilian Wilderness. It's about 500, 600 pages. He was really sick. He almost died on the trip. Uh, in fact, they thought he was going to die. But they got him out, and the last part, he was taken down in sort of a stretcher. This was a very, very <coughs> difficult trip. But he wrote the book. When he came back, he was done. Boy, I wish I could do that. Um, well, the horse part was only the first part. Before they got to the river, they had to drive, ride across what's called the Mata Grasso, uh, which is in the highlands of the southern Amazon basin. And that took them about a month. And that was all on horseback. So, all right, let's talk a little about working. Uh, I've uh, already mentioned the uh, Rough Rider days, so I won't go back. So let's go back to the ranching days. Uh, and he, he'd spent much time on horses, and it was very common to spend you know, 36 hours on horses, bad condition, particularly if there were stampedes at the night. They would circle, this is open range ranching, it's unfenced, nobody owns the land. It's a foolish thing to do from, a, from an ecological point of view, but that's a whole other story that I can tell you at another time. But, uh, uh, so that what they did is they, they'd let the, the cattle run free, and then a couple of times a year they had to round them up. And that was a big job, and it was all done entirely on horseback. And some of it was really dangerous because at night, there was no pen or anything. 
and you just put them in a place and the rider, one or two riders who spend all night riding around, one one way, one the other, <coughs> around the herd, singing to them. That's where the cowboy singing tradition comes from. Uh, they would sing, or better or worse, depending on the cows. <coughs> but if something spooked them, and anything could spook them, it could be you know, cattle herd. You never know what's going to spook them. But it could be a lightning strike, it could be a wolf shows up, whatever. And they go charging off, and you've got to bring them back, and you've got to round them up, and it's pitch dark, and some of it's planes, you know, there are gopher holes all over the place. Really dangerous work, dangerous work. But he threw himself into it and earned the, uh, the respect of the people. They started out with the four eyes and made fun of him. And you can see why once he was recorded that he was trying to get them to all start off doing something. He said, hasten forth quickly, please. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine how they reacted to that. <laughs> so they, fortunately, they thought it was funny. <laughs> so they laughed. And, but his willingness to do, T.R., throughout his life, believed that he never asked somebody to do something, a soldier, anybody, that he wouldn't do. So there's a story, this is a side story, him and the horses. He was at Sagamore Hill, he was president. The first operational submarine that the Navy had created, which was a tiny little thing, probably not as long as this room is, which had a crew of four or five people, came up to the Oyster Bay Harbor there, and T.R. heard about it, and he wanted to go out and see the captain. Very, very dangerous to be uh, submariners, even then, you know, then more so. They, all, <laughs> they called the, the first one the plunger. Can you believe that? I don't know. And sometimes it plunged and didn't return. Uh, anyway, he wanted to go on it. The Secret Service didn't want to let him, and it was a very bad, windy, stormy, nor'easter day. So he escaped from the, the Secret Service, and he got a little rowboat that he had there, and he rowed out to, the, to this little submarine and hailed the captain. And the captain, you know, obviously was quite startled. He said, well, can I come aboard? Yes, sir, of course. And he got on, he said, well, take her down. I want to drive her. <laughs> and so down they went. And the Secret Service didn't know anything about this, nor even more importantly did his wife. <laughs> and uh, so then he survived. He came back up. The next day, the papers really gave him a shellacking. You know, the President of the United States drowns in the plunger. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so back to the horses. Where was Oh, Sagamore Hill. So at Sagamore Hill, there were lots of horses, farm horses of all kinds, riding horses, carriage horses. He probably had 10 or 15 horses and an ever-changing crowd. Uh, that's a nice picture of the family uh, gathered around. At the White House, he also had many horses. And uh, there he is. That's his favorite horse. It's called Blistein, or Blistein, Blistein. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. A fellow named Blistein gave it to him. And that was his favorite horse during those years. It's a beautiful horse. And he used to ride all over the place. Uh, he would go out for rides in Rockford <coughs> Park pretty much every day, uh, ride around Washington. And in those days, the president could uh, uh, wander around, too. And so uh, uh, he, he had a lot of experience with horses there. He also, his kids had horses. And here's my grandfather. Um, Algonquin is the name of the pony. There's a story, Algonquin was my grandfather's horse, and uh, Archie was his name, Archie Roosevelt, in case you're interested. Grandfather had, oh, I don't know, mumps or measles or something, and was upstairs in the White House, and his brothers and sisters were feeling kind of sorry for him, so they brought Algonquin upstairs. <laughs> and this, this created uh, his, you know, grandma being <laughs> somewhat upset by it all. But T.R., like everything else, laughed it off. And I'll tell you another story. The military, T.R. noticed, T.R. was getting a little larger and a little heavier, as you've seen in some of these pictures. Uh, he felt that the senior officers in the Navy and the Army, the generals and the admirals, were you know, not in good condition and needed to be more in good condition. So he decided to challenge them. And he required, he, he made a requirement <coughs> that every senior officer needed to ride 100 miles in three days. Uh, and the uproar 
that came from the generals and the admirals. You can imagine, this is ridiculous. You, know, you could see him huffing and puffing and carrying on about this. So TR decided to show him up. So he decided he would ride to Warrington, which is you know, just about the same distance as Washington as you are, and back in one day, which was 100 miles. And not only, there were three of them that did it. Uh, they drove down, they rode down to uh, the Warren Green Hotel. I don't know, is that still there? Yes. Yeah. 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 Where he had lunch. The and is that the courthouse? If I got the wrong one, well. No. No. <laughs> oh, it's behind the courthouse. Okay, the experts are here. It's all, I always keep in mind that no matter what I'm talking about, there's somebody in the room that knows more about each one of the I hope they keep quiet, but not all of them. <laughs> your hometown. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I'm glad I got the right place. Anyway, so he rode down back, and when he came back, there was a blizzard. This was, I don't remember the day, it was the middle of winter. There was a blizzard. He rode back into Washington at about midnight in a blowing, blowing blizzard that everybody's slipping around and made it back. So that was one day. Here's one of the people that went with him, a guy named uh, Gary Grayson. I don't know who he are there Grayson's around here? Yeah. Yes. George, George is. Yes. Is that your My relative? My husband isn't here, but it's his grandfather. It's his grandfather. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, he was he a military officer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought so. He was one of the. This is obviously not that. Oh, he was the doctor. Yes, right. That's right. He went with two doctors, Rixley and Grayson. Now I remember. And I guess to patch him up, and did a. Yeah, that was a good choice on my part. <laughs> So, uh, you know, there wasn't much the generals and admirals could say after that, so they kind of knuckled under and did something for it. So, uh, in conclusion here, I'm going to tell one other story, but in conclusion, see, you, you see that how central horses were to TR. Uh, and still they cause, this is the other thing I want to talk about, still they cause controversy. Now, in North Dakota, where his ranch was, they created a national park, the Theodore Roosevelt National Park. Has anyone been there? Very few people go to North Dakota. You been there? Long time ago. Long time ago, yeah. Well, you're unusual. North Dakota is the least visited state. <laughs> um, but the great people there, great people. Anyway, so it's the only national park named after a person, and therefore obviously the only one named after a president, uh, national park. Uh, and they fenced it in I don't remember, you know, 20s or 30s or so. And when they fenced it in, uh, there were a bunch of horses there. And the horses were wild horses that were left over. It may easily have been one of TR's <coughs> horses there. The Sitting Bull's horse, we do know, was, you know, an ancestor of some of these horses because of the genetics they can do. So their horses are in, in the park. And they're a huge favorite. Everybody loves them. Here's, you can see why. Um, oh there's the Badlands. And they're gorgeous. Uh, well, the Park Service decided recently, I need your help here, folks. The Park Service decided recently they were going to get rid of them, get rid of the horses. And I'm, when I was in North Dakota, I met with the superintendent. She, poor girl, woman, I'm sorry, poor woman. Who, you know, this is not her thought, but she has to spout the line. And the line is, well, they take too much management time and, uh, you know, we can't spend enough time on the buffalo and the antelope and the elk and so on. And uh, so we're going to get rid of the horses. Uh, this cannot happen. This cannot happen. They were there when the place was fenced in. They were there when TR was there. They were there when the place was fenced in. Write your congressman and write somebody and tell them, you horse people, tell them they've got to stay. They've got to stay. I'm pretty fine. Have a right number, manage them ec ecologically manage them so they fit in with the other species, but keep the horses. Yeah. So that's what I have to say. Is there anything else I have to say? No. So thank you very much. <laughs>
I'm not a writer, basically, but when I was younger, I was. Uh, and so I did some Eastern writing, you know, various Eastern writing, but I spent a year, a summer, before I went to college in New Mexico, working, this is sort of a Roosevelt uh, habit. They send the sons off, they send the girls off too, but they send the sons off somewhere out west. And I was at the Carson National Forest in Taos, New Mexico, in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, as a very low-level park, uh, park forest service, get it straight, forest service. I meant to say forest service. And I didn't know anything about Western riding. And I arrived just like TR did, the Eastern dude. I had, I had a blue blazer, <laughs> chinos, and penny loafers. <laughs> and so on my first week, now I had glasses too, you uh, My first week, I was assigned to a guy named Andreas. He was a Chicano. He was kind of the master sergeant of the forest. The way I got there was grandfather fought in the Second World War in New Guinea as a frontline officer. Miserable, miserable. Did you too? No, I thought that's too bad. <laughs> miserable, miserable place. And his coat talkers were Apaches. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. People think that, you know, just the Navajos were coat. We used all the Indian tribes. So his, usually they had an officer and, you know, four, five, six men or whatever. And the officer who was educated, was a college grad, went on to become a Forest Service superintendent. He was superintendent of this particular forest. And grandfather knew him and asked him to take me out. So that's how I wound up there. So Andreas sort of had me under his shoulder. And a little Pueblo Indian boy, um, I don't mean little, he was huge. <laughs> but he, was, he was young. He was like 17, like me, 17 or 18, and was a Pueblo, Pueblo Indian and me. So this was an odd combination. Mm -hmm. And we spent the whole summer up in, the, up in the mountains, coming down once a week, and camping. It was a wonderful experience. So I learned how to ride there. I learned only at the last, time, the last few days I was there that Carson National Forest was the forest to which they sent horses that were considered dangerous and had killed someone. <laughs> <laughs> so my horse's name was Midnight. And I loved it. They, you know, they usually killed somebody because they were going through and then knocked somebody off. You know, so they didn't do. They were vicious horses. But anyway, that's where they were sent. And so I spent all summer on this killer. <laughs> 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 Thank God. Uh, but uh, I survived the experience, and I could tell a lot of stories about that too. Anyway, so that the the next thing that actually before this, I spent several summers in the borders of Scotland. Oh. Lovely. My stepfather was Scottish. He was a Scottish writer, and so my mother and my stepfather was a town, not coincidentally, called. My name comes from my mother's maiden name, Tweed. Uh, that's where I get my name. And this town was called Tweedsmuir. Uh, if you look it up, there it is. The middle of sheep country, so we were in sheep farms. And we lived in a stone cottage way up at the land, three miles from the nearest house. And behind us, this huge moor, like the gripping mire, if you're a Sherlock Holmes fan. Um, and uh, so when I arrived, I was, I think, I don't know, 13 or so, I suppose. And, uh, you know, I couldn't drive. And anyway, to drive up there, you had a, we had a Land Rover, and there was something like 14 gates. And they weren't the swinging kind of gates, they kind of, you know, you lift up. And you had to ford the, let me call it a burn, the little brook, you know, numerous times. So the first mode of transportation I was given there was a horse. My stepfather thought this was a good idea. So he bought this old nag from some, you know, somewhere, and it showed up. We didn't know anything about the horse. And, uh, but this was kind of a weird horse because it behaved perfectly normally, and then all of a sudden, it would do some trick. You know, it would suddenly rear up on its ear ends or go around in a circle for a and for no apparent reason. Well, eventually we found out it was a retired circus horse. That's great. And so you didn't know what the signals were. You did it by mistake, and it could charge off and go. Well, the rest of the time, it just plodded around. So that, that was really my first 
experience in that kind of thing. So those are my horse stories. Well, that's your an adventurer also. Oh yeah, I don't know if you, in my stepmother is sort of objecting to some of the adventures. I retraced TRs down the, the river of doubt in the Amazon, which hasn't changed any. Oh, that's right. Did uh, TR ever comment upon uh, how Taft riding a horse but based on his size? <laughs> no, that, I'll come to that in just a second. So, so, wait a minute, that triggered another idea, but I forgot what it was. Oh, yes, I should have, I meant to say this. When he was in the White House, I'll get to your question. When he was in the White House, they had horses, and somebody suggested that they get a car or an automobile. And TR said, no, no, no. He said, you Roosevelt are horse people. <laughs> so they didn't get one. He didn't eventually rode in one. Uh, so Taft, as you may recall, was large enough to get stuck in a bathtub. <laughs> and somebody had to come and haul him out of this bathtub. Well, he was sent to the Philippines as a, uh, you know, whatever we call the governor, I guess, there then. And he sent a, a letter, I suppose, back to the Secretary of State, who I think was Hay. Secretary Hay, who was a very clever man. Hay was both McKinley's Secretary of State and uh, TR's Secretary of State. He had always been, he never wanted to go elective office. He'd always been in an appointed office. He started out as one of two staff members, the only two staff members in Lincoln's White House during the war. He ran the war with two young men uh, as his secretaries or whatever they were called. Anyway, he was an extraordinary guy with an incredible sense of humor. He, I'll give you one example. A new British ambassador arrived, uh, in, this was during TR's tenure, and the ambassador uh, wanted, uh, you know, the, the, hey, a Secretary of State would take the ambassador around, show him around uh, Washington, and he took him down to Mount Vernon. And so they're standing on the lawn, you've all been to Mount Vernon, I'm sure, he's standing on that lawn that goes down to the river, and you see that vast expanse across the river in front of there. And so Hay tells the British, Ambassador, the story about how uh, Washington threw the silver dollar across the Potomac. And the ambassador looked at this huge expanse and he said to Hay, he said, I don't believe that he could, that George Washington could throw a silver dollar across that. At which point Hay said to him, I don't know why you say that. After all, he threw a sovereign across the Atlantic. <laughs> a very clever man. So he got a report from Taft about riding a horse up a mountainside in, uh, in uh, the Philippines and reporting about whatever he was reporting about the Philippines. And Hay sent a very short telegraph back to telegram back to which said, how's the horse? <laughs> All the silence? That can't be. Any more questions? Ooh, I got it. Oh. So this was just spectacular, and I counted about six times. You said, well, another time I could talk about this. So <laughs> I'd love to invite you. Would you come back? Yeah. <laughs> Um, we'd like to be downstairs and see the exhibit and also next door in the museum. And thank you all again, all our members. Thank you for supporting. If you're not a member, please consider joining, becoming a member, and be part of our incredible uh, organization here. Um, and it's on. It's so special to all of us. So thank you, everybody.